You know, it was a horrible war. We didn't want it. It was thrust upon us. I served seven years under those stars and stripes. And it was hard to turn around and let them go in some ways. But I knew I had a decision to make. I had to decide what I wanted to do. I had to decide what was right. And sometimes that's even harder than deciding what you want to do. Sometimes it's easy to say, I want to do this and I'm going to do it. But other times, like we talked earlier, you got to take the time and say what's right. What is right? But before I go into too much of that, I'm going to let Miss Flora tell you a little bit about her. You always get to hear my side of the story. All too often, you don't understand some of the things that she did, and where she came from, and what it was like for her. Because believe me, when we get through tonight, you'll know that her life was just as tough as mine as a soldier. So without any more from me right now, Ms. Flora, why don't you tell them a little bit about what life was like for you? Well, it was certainly different from, from me than it was for you. Um, he'll tell you about how he grew up, but let me tell you, I grew up completely different. I grew up with wonderful parents in the middle of nowhere in Fort Riley, Kansas, and it was desolate. It was, there was nothing there except a military base and lots of soldiers. It was um, no rolling hills and no green pastures. It was simply living on a, a military base. And there wasn't much for the young girls to do, um, except uh, we were taught by our parents. And um, my father was Philip St. George Cook. I had a brother and two sisters. And my mom, as you can imagine, being living out in the frontier, uh, she had taught us as long as she could. And then she decided that to be as prepared um, as we needed to be to find a nice husband and be prepared to find a nice husband that we had to be prepared um, to be lady. And so we were sent to Michigan to boarding school and to finishing school. And there I learned a lot. I learned um, how to play uh, musical instruments, the piano, the banjo, um, the guitar, I, I learned how to sing, and uh, lots of things. But my most favorite thing in the world, and I was familiar with it because living out on the plains and, and living in, um, with the military, I learned that my love was with horses. And so I was able to ride any time that I wanted to. I learned how to treat those animals and I, with, with much respect, and I felt that um, they respected me as, as well. They, I could handle a horse like nobody else, I thought, and just as well as some of those soldiers could. And so I did, and I grew up doing that for many years, and then I returned to the prairie. After my schooling was over, I returned, and again, I'm living on a military base. When I meet this wonderful, good-looking soldier, his name was Jeb Stewart. He was a young lieutenant, and I think it was love at first sight, for me anyway. We had a lot in common. We loved music, and we loved to sing and have a good time, but especially I think he was smitten over my, my uh, being able to handle horses. And so for years, well not for years, I'm, I take that back, just for four short months, we stayed close together um, doing the things that we liked to do. That was our courtship, just four quick months. And we rode those horses and um, 
and played our instruments and we enjoyed each other. We had that in common. Well, we decided to marry and he took me back home to his family in Virginia. I met his family. Um, there was some misfortune there, but I'll let him tell you that later. And then we were married. Um, we had two wonderful years together when we were married before our family started. And then we started um, having children. We had a beautiful, beautiful young girl, little baby girl, and her name was Flora. He insisted that he name all of our children. Now, I don't know why. Ladies, you may be used to that. I was not used to that because my father had no, nothing to do with that naming children or rearing children. My mother did it all. But he really wanted to do that. So, of course, he named her his little Flora. She was the apple of her daddy's eye. He loved her more than anything in the world. Blonde curly hair and blue, blue eyes and just loved her pa. She, she was precious and we enjoyed her for a couple of years and then her brother came. His name was Philip St. George Cook Jr. Named after my father who was commandant of the military base um, for the U.S. Army. Well, the, the general will tell you a little bit more about that in just a minute, but um, we had heard stirrings of disruption in our country. It was difficult to get information. Sometimes we could get telegraphs. Sometimes we couldn't. Sometimes people would deliver information. But it was still difficult. But when we know that there's disruption in the country and certain things come by your way, you want to pay attention because it might have something to do with you. And so that's what was going on. I was taking care of our children living in a one-room uh, house or cabin on this military base, not having a lot to do with a lot of people because there just weren't a lot of people around and not a lot of things to do. But the general got word of this upset and he started um, in on finding some more information and finding out how he could help. And, uh, and I'll let you tell them about that because you know more about it. Well, like she said, we had, we had a wonderful life together uh, thus far. We were four years into our marriage. It's 1859, and we made a trip back to Virginia to visit family. And I had developed a, a device for hitching your saber to the horse and to your belt. I was fortunate enough that this patent was, or this device was uh, very worthwhile to the military and I had a patent on it and I actually sold it to the military and they gave me five thousand dollars for it but during that time and that was quite a sum of money at that time and it so what I looked at was it was a chance for us to spend time with family and I had made a little money and I was at the war department in and out on a daily basis when word came of an uprising up at Harper's Ferry. And we got word on that and it really bothered us. And so we were trying to figure out uh, what should we do? And somebody said, could General, could somebody go over and get Colonel Lee? And uh, I happened to be outside the office. I said, I'd be more than happy to. I know where Arlington is. I had the opportunity to know the the good colonel when he was the commandant at West Point. I'll talk about that in just a second. But Quentin got Colonel Lee and we came back and they told us what the problem was. This, this guy, Calvert, 
John Smith had taken over Harper's Ferry. And they needed a, somebody to go up there and do something about it. <laughs> Here's the strange part about this. We went to three separate groups before we finally got some help. The first group was a local militia. And when we went to this group, we said, we need some help. There's been an uprising at Harper's Ferry. We explained the situation. Would you be willing to go with us? And they looked at us and said, no, sir. Our job is here. Our job is to protect the home front. We're local militia. That's, that's out of our area. We don't need to go there. And we went to a second group of militia, and we asked them the same question. And we got the same answer. And then we went to a group of Marines. Lieutenant Green was their commander. And Colonel Lee asked him the same question. He said, sir, I'd be honored. And he put together his contingent of Marines, about 40-some men. We put them on the train, and we sent them straight to Harper's Ferry. Then he and I ran around trying to get uniforms and weapons and stuff that we needed to, to finish the mission. And we got on the train later that evening, and we weren't on the train. We were in the engine compartment. And it was me and Colonel Lee and the engineer. And we developed our plan as we made our way to Harper's Ferry. And our plan was very simple. It wasn't a complicated plan. We had a decision to make. Something was going to happen, and we were going to be in control of the situation. So the next morning around 6 o'clock, I go down to the Arsenal House where these group of men are holed up. And I knock on the door. And when I do so, the door opens about this far. An old pistol or an old rifle comes out and hits me right here in the chest. I'm looking at this thing trying to figure out what am I going to do now? But I had a job to do. I'd been given my instructions by Colonel Lee. <coughs> And so, I told the man standing at the other end of the gun what had to happen. You're to release your prisoners. You're to surrender. You're to walk out. Or else we'll take over this place. He tried to negotiate. We see there was only one problem with this. I knew the man. From our time in Kansas, when we had to try to put down... <coughs> the problems between the free states and the slave states. I had an opportunity to deal with not Captain John Smith, but Mr. John Brown. And I saw me Brown was the man going to the other end of that rifle that was laying against my chest. And after a few minutes, I saw that he wasn't going to do what I'd asked him to do. And the prearranged signal was for me to drop my hat and step back. With that one motion, in rushed a group of Marines. They knocked the door down, and in a matter of three minutes, it was over. We got our people out. Of course, John Brown was knocked out. He came to later, and we had a conversation. And he looked at me, and he said, you know, with the twitch of a finger, I could have ended your life. I said, yes, sir. And with one swipe of my sharp saber, I could save Virginia a lot of money. <laughs> well, as you all know, the trial was held. A few days later, he was convicted. And he was hanged. And that's where a second great man comes into the picture in relation to my background. That's where... A young man, well, not so young, but a man from VMI took a bunch of cadets up, and their job was to guard the hanging site. That's where Jonathan, Thomas Jonathan Jackson was. A man we later call Stonewall. And he oversaw that. 
But on the day that we took the, the arsenal back, that afternoon we went over and recovered over a thousand pikes in a nearby farm. Brown was hoping that he could cause an insurrection, an uprising that never happened. That was his goal. We left and went back to Kansas. And like I said, I had the great opportunity to, to serve with some wonderful men out there. Her father was one of my favorites. Favored so much, like she said, that we named our son after him. But also despised when the war broke out and he decided that he was going to stay with the Union. He, a Virginian, just like I was, decided that he was going to stay with the United States Army. Decided that he was going to be a traitor to his native country. And at that time, I told Miss Flora, that name will never be spoken in our family again. And we changed the name of our son from Philip St. George Cook Stewart to James Ewell Brown Stewart Jr. That name would never be spoken again in our house. <coughs> but we never really had a house. We never really had a home. Like I said, I spent seven years in the military. I spent four years at West Point, of which time Colonel Lee was my commandant for two years. I told you I'd get back to that story. The great Colonel Lee came in in my junior year. And you know, he brought something that all of us young guys love to see at West Point. He brought four daughters with him. <laughs> and of course, Custis was one of my classmates there. And I always had the opportunity to go to the house on Saturday night. And it was always a, a custom that when I'd walk in, I'd take Miss Mary, one of his daughters, and we'd walk through the garden. Because being raised at my mother's knee in Southwest Virginia, I knew that I loved flowers. I love to garden. I understood most all varieties. And Miss Mary and I would walk through the garden and we'd talk about the beautiful flowers there at West Point. And we'd come back in the double doors and I'd see the good Colonel and his wife, Miss Mary, he often called her Mims. And I'd see them in the corner whispering back and forth to each other. And he'd say something and she'd kind of shake her finger at him. He'd say, what we all say, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and it was only years later that I learned that he says, what's that Stuart boy doing with my Mary? And what are they doing walking in the garden again? And she was always saying, because I like him. And I want him here. And if that's what I want, that's what we're going to do. And he would always say, yes, dear. <laughs> but like I said, it was, there were some wonderful times there. And then, of course, my first assignment out in Texas, and then up when I had the opportunity to meet her. Now, she told you the short version. I'm going to tell you the good side. I'd been out on reconnaissance. We'd been looking for a little uprising, and I came back in hot and tired and dusty. And I looked up, and there was this lady on this horse, and this horse was giving her a fit. And she wrangled that horse as good as any of my cavalry troopers could. <coughs> and I said, I've got to know more about her. <laughs> you guys know where I'm getting on this. And then I found out she could sing, she could dance, she could play the piano, she could play the guitar, she could ride, she could shoot, she could cook. Home run. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote my dad in, a, in, in less than a month, I wrote my dad and said, I found the love of my life and we're going to be married. But before that happened, I lost dad. But we were married a few short months later, like she said. And she talked about little Flora coming in. I'm going to tell you something. I may have some parents and some grandparents here. And there's a little girl right back there that's just as cute as she can be. But, brother, I'm here to tell you, as cute as she is, she couldn't match my little Flora. <laughs> <laughs> them little blonde ringlets, them big baby blue eyes. I mean, she'd look at her pa, she could get anything she wanted. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, the war came upon us. And after Harper's Ferry, we went back to Kansas. We continued to raise our family, and I continued to watch. We got what news we could from time to time. And 
We knew it was just a matter of time, like anything in life. When the time came, the decision had to be made. And I had already requested leave. The secession convention had been held. South Carolina had left in December. The other states had decided, and other states were deciding all along. And I was waiting to see what happened with Virginia. And we were at the confluence of the Mississippi and the Ohio River, a little place called Cairo, Illinois, when I got word that Virginia had voted to secede. And with that, I sat down and I penned my resignation after seven years as a captain in the United States Army. And at the same time, I wrote my cousin, Governor Letcher, and I said, sir, I need a position in your army. Don't care. For I knew right or wrong, or wrong or otherwise. As Virginia goes, so go I. Well, I'd rather be a private in Virginia's army than be a general in any army that would try to coerce her into doing anything different. Mm -hmm. I knew what states' rights meant. I knew what we were all about. You have to understand, we were just a, a young country. These great united states that we had together were just 80-some years mm -hmm. old. But Virginia had been around since the 1600s. It was over 200 years old. It was my country. It was my native home. And I had to go that way. The choice was, was very easy to make. And I did. Different people had to look at different things and make different decisions. And it wasn't that bad. When I reported into Governor Letcher's office, he sent me over to be with Major Jackson, now Colonel Jackson, in the Valley. And when I first arrived to him, I was still wearing the blue dress uniform of an Army officer. And we sat down and we had a long conversation. And we talked about God because I was from a strict Episcopalian upraising. My wife, my mother taught me from a small child. I learned to read from the Bible. Christianity was part of my, my, my basic tenets of life every day. I took an oath at age 12 never to take a drink. An oath I kept to my dying day. But I knew when I sat there and I talked to Colonel Jackson, what a good man this was. What a fair man this was. And we immediately bonded. We talked about something called the black flag. We knew what it meant. We understood war. No, I'd never been in war like he had. Or General <clears throat> Lee. But I understood it. I understood from the dealings I had with the Indians in the plains. I'd been wounded earlier in my career. I survived it. I still carried the bullet. But it was no big problem. <clears throat> but we had a wonderful time together. And I could sit here and we could talk battles all night long. And we could talk about First Manassas. We could talk about what happened at Kelly's Ford. We could talk about <coughs> Gettysburg. And I know some people always love to ask me, where was I at? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you simply, I was doing what my commander told me to do. <laughs> you know? But what we want to talk about tonight is we're talking about family and we're talking about good times together. And you know, Miss Flora and I never had a home. We often talked about coming back to Virginia and going back to Laurel Hill over in Patrick County. And we always thought that if we could just have a small part of the home place and live our days out there, how happy we could be. We talked about what a wonderful opportunity it would be to raise our children in Virginia. And to teach them the southern way of doing things. 
we did as best we could with our two children that we had then. But in 1862, we had a serious problem come up. That little flora that I love to talk about was ill with the fever. This was just before Fredericksburg. And I got a letter from Flora and she said, your lapet is sick. And that was my nickname for her. She's not doing well. And we don't know how much longer she may last. We need you at home. And we made a pact before I ever left, before the war ever started, that my place and my duty was with my men, defending my country. And she knew I wouldn't come, but she asked. And I had to tell her no. And I simply wrote her a letter back and said, it's been several days since the illness first happened. And it would take me several more to get to you. And in the course of that time, she may pass. <clears throat> and we have to put it in God's hands. But if I go back and she's better, I've wasted the time. And I'm needed here. I have a duty and an obligation here. It was on the 6th of November, just a few days before her birthday. Major Von Bork came to my headquarters tent that night and he brought me a letter that told me of my passing of Little Flora. And in that letter, my wife told me the last things that I could understand of how she died missing her father, but she died courageous. And I pinned her a letter back and I said, she's in a better place. She is with our maker. She's at a place right now where she needs to be because she was not of this world. She was in a far better place. And it was hard for us. And she came to see me at Christmas and we spent some time together and we had dinner together as best we could, being soldiers. But times were hard for all soldiers. I wasn't the only one. General Lee, President Davis, we all lost family members. It was a hard time. <clears throat> a year later, though, we were blessed. We had another little girl. And we named her Virginia after the great state of Virginia. And her middle name was Pillow. And if any of you know who I'm talking about, that artillerist, Major John Pelham, was like a brother to me. And that's where we took the name. And we had decided before little Virginia was ever born that whether it be a boy or a girl, the name Pelham would be in the name. This was in October of 63. Little did I know that my time was short upon this earth. In May of 64, things are getting hairy. It's tough all over. Command has changed again up north. Sherman has made some bold statements about it. he could whip Stuart anytime, any place, anywhere. And Meade was tired of hearing these. And he took it to Grant and he told him of what Sherman had said. And Grant's comment was, well, turn him loose. Nobody else has been able to do that. Let's see if he can do what he says. What's it going, what's it going to mean to us? And with that, he took 10,000 soldiers and left coming through the wilderness. And I took 3,500 to try to stop him, and they were headed for Richmond. We tagged him for two days. We finally got in front of him. On the 10th of May, I had the opportunity to stop at the Fontaines up at Beaver Dam. And I spent about an hour with Flora. I had some asparagus soup. Never got off my horse. Held a little Virginia. Seven months old at the time. 
Little Jimmy was playing in the background. We talked about faith. We talked about God. We talked about Virginia. We talked about family. And I told her then, I'm content. I'm satisfied. That should I die in battle, I'll be fine. I'll finally have a chance to see my little Flora again. But I know she's watching over me on the field of battle every day. It didn't bother me. <clears throat> After about an hour, I leaned over out the saddle and gave her a kiss goodbye. And Major Venerable and I turned and made our way back to the troops coming down Plank Road. We made our way down to Yellow Tavern where we decided to put up our fortifications. And there at Yellow Tavern, we put up the halt. And we stopped. And we fought. We had a small skirmish that morning. That afternoon, we had a big one. <clears throat> they broke through our fortifications, and those guys from Michigan, those Wolverines, determined that they were going to get the best of us, never could. And as we turned them back, an old sharpshooter, now a cavalry officer, turned and fired blindly into the air and caught me up underneath the rib cage. Mm -hmm. They took me back to Richmond. I arrived there late that afternoon. But as they took me off the battlefield, I watched my soldiers. And I told them to go back. Go back and do your duty as I have done mine. Go back. Fitz will lead you where you need to go. I knew that my time was drawing nigh. Even then, we arrived back at Dr. Brewer's house my brother-in-law. He looked over me. <clears throat> he told me it was serious. I made it through the night. The next morning, I asked that my family be sent for it. I had visitors off and on all day. President Davis came by to visit. Several of the generals, the chief of staff, different men came in to visit. Major Venerable came in, and we sat down, and we tried to decide who would get what horse. I told him I wanted my son to have my saber. But I said, there's a little flag inside the brim of my hat from a lady in South Carolina who asked me to wear it into battle. Would you please see that she gets it back? And I did. I had worn it into battle. I'd done it as she asked. And I asked Major Venerable to make sure that that got back to her. These were some of the discussions we had. Heroes von Barke, my big Prussian, came in to visit. He had been wounded about a year earlier. We thought he was dead, just like we thought we lost Major Pella. And he sat with me. I told him I'm going to regain my strength and I'm going to be like you, Bart. I'm going to be able to come back. And he said, sure you will, General. The Reverend Peter came in. We had church services. We sang all the different hymns, but especially my favorite, Rock of Ages. And when the services were over with, we prayed. We could hear the battle going on outside the city. But at 7.38 on May the 12th, I closed my eyes and breathed my last breath. And with that, I said, God's will be done. He sent for us, little Jimmy, little Virginia, and me, and we didn't make it in time. I had word that he had died three, about three hours before we got there. We had done the best we could with what we had in travel. And somehow I wasn't surprised when I heard that he had been wounded. Do you see, I had seen so much death and so many people wounded because, as he said, we had no home. And home was sort of where I hung my hat. 
You know, it was uh, living with family members, living with in a boarding home, living with uh, friends, anyone that he could make arrangements with that we could move to be close to him if and when he ever got time to see us. But just like every other refugee during that time, moving from here to there, anywhere we went, there was death. Just illness and death all over. It was a sad time. As you can imagine, it was everywhere. But the next morning, I made arrangements for him to be buried in Hollywood Cemetery. My sister, Mrs. Brewer, was there. Dr. Brewer was there. And they were helpful. William Alexander Stewart was my husband's older brother. He had been notified, and he came, and he was very helpful. You see, they made a pact that if anything happened to my husband, during the war that he would help me, that he would help me um, financially, put a roof over my head, help our children be educated, and he was still determined to do that. You see, I had the $50 from the hitching device that he had a patent on, and William Alexander had taken out a $10,000 life insurance policy. I was okay financially. But the children and I needed to move. We needed to get away from the, the war. So much strife and, and so much danger ahead. So William Alexander took, he, took us with him to Saltville, Virginia. And there we stayed for 12 years. He was very gracious. His family was gracious, and my sister-in-law and I started a school. See, all that teaching that I had gotten earlier in boarding school and finishing school paid off. I was able to teach. I, we taught in a cabin, a two-story cabin. My children and I lived on first, second floor, and we taught school on first floor. And I was able to teach my brother's children, my sister's children, and anyone that I could. You see, it was some way that I could give back and some way that I could be busy and to do something um, in the way of being patriotic to the country rather than, than fight and do other things that we'd already been able to do with the soldiers. But... My husband had wanted, one of his wishes had been that I educate our children south of the Mason-Dixon line. And because of his duty and because of his determination, I really wanted to make sure I did that. That was one of his last requests of me, and that I did. I, I, after moving from Saltville, Virginia, I got an appointment at um, a seminary, a Lutheran seminary, and I taught there for a few years. And then it was interesting, I was recommended by Robert E. Lee to go and teach um, to be headmistress at the um, military, the female institute in Staten, Virginia. And there, that was the sister school of VMI. There I taught for the rest of my, well, almost the rest of my life. And to this day, it's named Stuart Hall after what I had done. I had to take leave, and I guess you could say I retired, and I was 62. See, I was 28 when he died. He was 31. I never remarried. I was a widow the whole time. I honored his memory. I did everything I thought that he wanted me to do. At 62, I retired 
because Virginia died to giving birth to one of my grandchildren, my last grandchild. She and her husband had lived in Roanoke, Virginia, and I moved there to help him take care of our children, her children. And I did that until I was 82 years old, at which time I fell down two steps, hit my head, and I never get, regained consciousness. <clears throat> and at that day, I joined my husband in Hollywood Cemetery. Flora came to join me at Hollywood Cemetery 59 years to the day after I went to Hollywood. She remained true to the cause. She understood what our mission in life was. She raised our children as, and other children as young Southern men and women. She taught them how to be Southern ladies and Southern gentlemen. She did the things that I asked. These were the greatest things I could ever hope for. She honored me in so many ways in all that time. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our ceremony for the evening. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I won't be shy. She was five when she went to meet our maker. I was 31 when I passed away. Uh, it's, you know, when you study Jim's life, it's, he, he was a very Christian man. He was very strong in that upbringing. And like I said, he, he maintained that battle of absence until his dying day. Uh, his mother took him to church every Sunday. They had, he was number seven out of 11. And every Sunday they'd get on the buckboard and they'd go into town from, from Ararat down to, to Mount Airy. And it's about seven miles to the, to the church down there. And they'd stop just before they got there and they'd get cleaned up. And they'd put on their Sunday best and they'd go into town and they'd line up on the pew and they knew they had to watch their P's and Q's. And then they'd come back home after church. You know? His best friends were named Dickie and Sucky and, and uh, Ben. And they were all the little black slaves that lived on the plantation with him. You know, but they were his friends. Somebody said that Jeb ever owned any slaves. He was given two when his father passed away and he got rid of both of them. One he got rid of, one of the, the ladies, because she mistreated little Flora. And the other one he released. Uh, he said he that wasn't what he was. He uh, had never really had them. And they were friends to him. And that's the way they always were. You know, he had a manservant while he was in service, uh, Bob. Played the bones. He was a mulatto. Bob was Bob was one of the men. You know, Sam Sweeney played the, the banjo. He believed in music and, and, and merriment in his his midst because he said, "My men are going to be happy today. They're going to party today because they may go into battle and die tomorrow." He loved his men. When he trained them, he'd go out and he'd live with them. He'd say, "Follow me." He didn't tell him to go do it. He said, come on, I'll show you. He actually took me in into the, into the lines and he, he said, listen. And they were close enough to the enemy they could hear him talking. And then they started firing and they fire artillery rounds over the top of it. He said, that's what war sounds like. And they said, well, General, why are we here? He said, you need to know what it sounds like because when you get in battle, you won't be afraid of it. These were things that he believed in. And he and Jackson and Lee always took time out for a moment of prayer. They never forgot it. They were best of friends. They joked. Everybody looks at Stonewall and looks at that stern expression that old General Jackson would give you. But he was a jokester too. He enjoyed having a good time. And he and Stuart could have some of the best. Mm -hmm. Lee was a practical joker. He loved to play jokes. 
You know, and there was nothing he liked better than than to get you in a position of where he could play a joke on you. There's a story that's told of a set of golden spurs. <clears throat> he had got a brand new coat from a lady in Baltimore. And then the box was a <coughs> box addressed to me. So he sent for me, and this was at Christmas time, and Miss Flora was with me, and we got a horse for her, and we rode to his headquarters, and we had what would pass for coffee at the time. And he pushed the little box across the table. He said, General, he said, we're planning some things right now, and I need to know if the information in this box is, is some importance to our campaign. And I opened it, and I took the brown paper off. Inside was a pair of golden spurs. And of course, Miss Flora looks at me and says, tell me more about this lady in Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, she's just an older lady that sends us things from time to time. And she says, really? And uh, she raises her riding dress up just a little bit. She said, well, I think those spurs will fit my boots just fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he enjoyed getting his hand in those positions. He, he, he frolicked it. And in 62, when we had dinner, uh, Christmas dinner at the Corbin House, at that time, he, he picked at General Jackson about the fact that there was a gamecock on the butter. He said, what kind of general are you that has all these wild animals' heads around his office and a game cock on your butt? He said, I thought you were a Christian man. I thought you were a much more sensitive man than that. And he just thought it was the funniest thing, but that was the way he was. He was a good man. And then there was a story that was told about him leaving the battlefield at Gettysburg, and he goes by the wounded Union soldier, and he starts talking about the Yankees and how they're going to beat the Southern boys. And General Lee stops and gets off his horse and goes over there with his men. And he looks down and the, this story was actually told by a Union soldier. You can Google it and you'll be fine. But he looked up at the General and he said, I knew my days were done then. I fully expected to be killed. And he said, General Lee knelt down and put his hand on him and apologized to him and said, son, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that this happened to you. And he called for his, his surgeon. And he came over and took care and gave medical assistance to him. That was the kind of man our generals were. Those were the kind of men that we respected in the South. And those are the kind of men that's going to lead the South in the future. That's what we've got to have. That's what it's got to be. I'll shut up. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Um, did you reconcile with your dad? Good question. Thank you for asking that. Yes, I did. In a way. We were estranged throughout the whole war. Um, I had been able to communicate with my mother um, from time to time. She would write my sisters and give them information on how they were doing. And of course, it would get filtered down to me. And I would write her and let her know. But my father, he retired <coughs> in uh, 1869, and it was then he uh, sent me a letter, and he said, I want to see you and my grandchildren. Well, we, I had traveled there uh, without the children that time. Because I didn't know what to expect. You know, I hadn't seen my father in years. And um, he met me at the train station. And we went home. It was wonderful seeing my mother. And it was good seeing my dad. But you know, remember he was in the U.S. Army. And one day... <coughs> He was having tea with a visitor in his living room, or whatever they called it, and called me in. Um, I, w I went in to meet this person that he was visiting with. He was a colonel in the U.S. Army, uh, Edgar or Elger, I can't quite remember the name, 
But when he introduced me to this man, he's, this, this person said, Ma'am, I just want to let you know I am the one who gave the order for your husband to be shot. And I left, didn't have anything to say, and I didn't go back. So, again, I mean, that was kind of the final straw. Yeah. Thank you. Any others? <laughs> I want to know when you were ranked on the court and you do that side saddle. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was how rut ladies were ranked. <laughs> Thank you again. We appreciate it.